22 For what saith the scripture Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory for ever and ever Amen Galatians chapter 1 verses 3, 4 and 5 My name is Don and my co-host is George This podcast will challenge you and more often than not confront and offend you Most of our topics you will not like In fact, you will probably hate Nevertheless, we are about telling you the truth whether you like it or not. So, wherever you are listening, have your Bible ready and try and enjoy what saith the Scripture. It's Friday, 11th of October. More of the same, week after week. Uh, same here. <laughs> so, today, Don, we're going to talk about the Orthodox religion. Yeah, it's amazing, really, after we sort of decided we should talk about the Orthodox religions. Well, it's an Orthodox religion, but they're all made up. They're all just got different countries, haven't they? Yeah, there's... Um there's Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Latvian, Serbian, Macedonian. There's even, I saw a documentary many years ago and there were uh, African Orthodox, believe it or not. So, yeah, it covers a lot of a wide range of people. Because in, in a sense, they seem to get a free ride from like the people that like to expose fake religions or false doctrines and cults and sects. I mean, the Catholics are always talked about, the Hindus, um, Islam, and obviously all the cults and sects like Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Christadelphians, and so on. But no one ever seems to talk about the Orthodox religion. No, there's no, no one out there to expose them, really. I, I haven't really seen anything. I've heard a few sermons from pastors in the past and they may touch on the subject just mention something but they're pretty much left alone you're right they have had a free run mm, yeah i mean i'm sure there's stuff out there and people do talk about them I'm not compared to you know such a some of the other bigger re- religions and orthodox is quite i mean it's quite a big religion i mean it's got to be up there with with you know catholics and islam and orthodox i well, mean there must be you know a lot a big a lot of following well, I, I had a look on the internet, Don, and currently there's about 250 million Orthodox followers in this world. Well, out of 7 billion people, I suppose that's not that much, really. No, not really. Not really. I suppose they have their fair share, but that's 250 million people going to hell, Don. Yeah, well, that's a lot of people. Yeah, it is. Well, out of the 7 billion people on Earth today... I mean, just take a step in the dark. How many did you reckon are saved? You know, and the rest are going to hell. I mean, what would you, what would you say? I don't know, Don, but I remember Jesus Christ saying that about heaven and getting saved, few there be that find it. Most of the people are on their way to hell. So, if it's most, it's definitely over fifty percent that are going to hell. From what I see personally in my life, in my walkings, in my experience, I would say less than 10%. Yeah, well, 50% is not most. I mean, you've got to get most of, a, you know, most of 100% would be close, like you said, up to 90% or so. Yeah. With 10%, I mean, that's pretty good as well. I mean, I don't even yeah. think it would be that much. Yeah, I don't know, Don. I don't know. But the people that when when we've been door knocking and we've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people, it's very rare to come across someone 
who is genuinely saved. And if you expand that, you know, on a worldwide level, I, I'm assuming it'll be the same thing. Well, the scripture in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Mm -hmm. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So out of 7 billion, it says many are going to go into the broad, yeah. the broad way, the destructive way. So, right. again, it's speculative. How much does many mean? Many means a lot. So yep. out, of, out of the 7 billion people on earth today, you know, it's scary thinking about it. Yeah, it is, Zion. Yeah, very sad. But uh, and another thing is, again, tonight, we also, well, not myself, but in your case, you grew up as a Greek Orthodox. So you're also, you'll be talking about this also from experience. That's right. John. Like that's yeah. um, like last week when we spoke about slaying in the spirit with the Pentecostals. Well, we were Pentecostals, and the yeah. time we did the Twilight Zone about the independent fundamental King James occasionally churches. Well, we were independent fundamental Baptists. Like a lot of the stuff we talk about, we've actually experienced. Myself, I was a raised a Catholic, so yeah. when the time comes when we do a podcast on Catholicism, again it'll. A lot of it will be from experience. So tonight, you'll be able to talk uh, from experience. You grew up as an Orthodox. That's right, John, I did. And it's, it's just a bit of a side note, but you were born a Catholic. I was born an Orthodox. Another person was born uh, charismatic. Another person was born in, uh, into Islam, into Buddhism, into Hinduism. And from young, they're taught that their religion is the only true religion. And... They didn't ask to be born into that religion. I didn't ask to be born in a Greek Orthodox. You didn't ask to be born a Catholic. Now, if, for example, the Orthodox religion is the only true religion and if you do everything that they say to do, you get to heaven, then God is unjust because no one asks to be born into a false religion, true? Exactly, yep. So there is no true religion. Everyone is born basically to go to hell. And except you receive Jesus Christ the way the Bible says so, there is no salvation. Well, the few. There is no, there is no salvation, what I'm trying to say, is in religions. No, but the few people that get born into a family that's actually born again and saved, yeah. uh, they're the lucky ones. Well, yeah. They get to hear the gospel from a young age and you know, hopefully they should get saved. Uh, if the parents raise them properly yeah. and they teach them properly, I can't see why they can't get saved. Why yeah. wouldn't they if they've been raised? And well, they, they have an advantage, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what people say about God's not fair because someone that gets born in, the, in, the, in an Islamic country, what chance have they got to find the truth if Christianity is the truth? I said, well, like yourself and myself, we were born... You know, I was born in a Catholic religion, and I ended up finding the truth. That's right. If anything, it's harder for us because... We're so close. Yeah, I mean, as a Catholic, everyone already knows they do believe Jesus is the Son of God. They believe in the Trinity. They believe he died on the cross. They believe he rose from the dead. Uh, they, they get a lot of it correct. So, but like where Islam is completely different. So it's chalk and cheese. You can say, well... If you're going to become a Christian, it's completely different to Islam. So it's harder when you're actually obviously not in the truth. You just wave it a little bit to the left or to the right. I think it's harder to sort of come out of there because you think, well, oh, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. What's your problem? That's right. Well, George, I suppose you're going to do most of the talking tonight and uh, I'll sort of probably be more of a just a uh, spectator. You know it as well as I do, Don. You have the same scriptures, so we'll share it. Sure. So it's all, the floor's yours, George. Where do you want to start? Sure. Well, Don, basically, the Orthodox religion and the Catholics pretty much believe the same thing. Now, they believe that they started at the beginning. That's when their church started, which is not true. And as we go along, you'll see that it's impossible that 
they were the original church. But what happened was uh, there was part of the church in Rome. There was they were spread over sort of like the area of Rome through to Turkey, and there were two two parts of it. One of them mainly in Rome, and one of them mainly in Constantinople in Turkey. Both of those sides wanted to to run the show, and because of a few differences, they split in the year 1054. So the one in Rome was called the Catholic Church. The one in Constantinople was called the Orthodox Church. And as we discussed earlier, that encompasses Greeks, Russians, Latvians, Macedonians, Africans. There's quite a lot of countries which are do have the Orthodox religion as their main religion. So sorry, now, the George, word, the Orthodox started in 1054, did you say? That's when that one church split and became the Catholic and the Orthodox Church. But before that was just Catholic, was it? Well, before that, I'm not too sure, Don. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I've tried to find some information, but uh, it's possible that they were just the Catholic. But the word Orthodox means the right way. But after we've gone through this podcast, people are going to say it's the wrong way. <laughs> so they've, they've given themselves a wrong name. But even the word Orthodox or Catholic, neither of those words are Bible words. They're just words made up by man. It's as simple as that. Now, they say they believe the Bible, but the truth is that they put the writings of their church fathers and their traditions of their Orthodox religion above the authority of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just going to give you some names of some church fathers. Clement of Rome, and all these so-called old church fathers wrote all these so-called epistles as well. And these are the writings that the Orthodox religion put above Scripture. We've got Clement of Rome, the first epistle of Clement to the Corinthians. So he wrote a letter to the Corinthians. Mathetes, the epistle of Mathetes to Diognetus. Polycarp, the epistle of Poly Polycarp to the Philippians. The encyclical epistle of the church at Smyrna. Ignatius, the epistle of Ignatius to the Ephesians, to the Magnesians, to the Trallians, to the Romans, Philadelphians, and so on and so forth. Uh, Barnabas, the epistle of Barnabas, Justin Martyr. There's Chrysostom, there's Arrhenius. There's many of these guys. Now, the important thing to note here, Don, is these men were Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Syrians, Africans, but they were all Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Now, you may ask, so what? What is that important? All right? In Romans 3, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, or the Word of God says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now, oracles are sayings or words or something of someone, and they're given to someone to write down. Now, all these men, which the Orthodox religion put their faith in in their epistles, they're all Gentiles. God didn't give his oracles to any Gentiles. So basically, we can immediately dismiss the writings of these men as they are non-Jews. Apart from that fact, the, the King James Bible is available to people everywhere, and these writings are just sacred to these religions. Well, I've never heard of and, them, George, to tell you the truth. I mean, I've heard of the, some of the uh, fathers that you mentioned, but yeah. I didn't he I've never heard... I didn't actually know that they had epistles. Yeah, I, I didn't know either. And it wasn't until I did some investigation that I found all these things. And I've lightly read some of them, and they, they contradict the Word of God so much, it's just unbelievable that you can reconcile God's Word with these false epistles or 
prophets or whatever you want to call them. Were they actually New Testament fathers of the New Testament church? They were part of that false religion, which used to be the Catholic and Orthodox united, where they accepted infant baptism and they believed the Eucharist was the actual body and blood of Christ. And they, they say venerate, but basically they worship Mary. When you bow down and pray to someone and worship them and kiss pictures of them, that's worship, that's not veneration. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get to those. But uh, basically already we can see that because they have so much faith in these false fathers, church fathers and their false epistles, this religion is already a questionable religion. It's as simple as that. Sure. Let's first take a look at the priests. The men, which are the ones who teach and propagate the lies of this religion. The priests who call themselves father. We'll get to that. Now, the priests of the Orthodox religion are not legitimate priests. In order to be a priest of God, they must first be Jewish and be able to prove their genealogy to Aaron. Mm -hmm. Now, Aaron, if you remember, was Moses' brother. Okay. Now, God had ordained Adam and his son to be priests. The Levites which Aaron was a great-grandson of Levi, were to minister unto Aaron and to his sons and were to keep his charge. Now, that's what the Bible says, which, which meant that they were to obey him, look after him, minister to him. So if Aaron said to them, look, go out and get us food for dinner tonight, clean the temple, do this, do that, whatever, they were there to serve them. Mm -hmm. Now... I'm going to read a passage. It's quite long. How about I read the first five verses and you can read from six to ten. Okie dokie. Okay, now this is in Numbers chapter three, verses one through to ten. These also are the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spake with Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. And Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. And Eleazar and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron their father. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister unto him. And they shall keep his charge, and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation, to do the service of the tabernacle. And they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Okay, so what we can see from this is that God had a, an office, which was a priest's office, and he appointed Aaron and his sons to be in that priest's office. And anyone, if you notice from verse 10, that came forward to be a priest, wasn't a Levite, was put to death. Okay then, a few more scriptures here. Second Chronicles 13, verses 9 and 10. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, Again here, we've got the priests of the Lord are the sons of Aaron and the Levites. And have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands, so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods. So people that came forth who weren't the sons of Aaron and the Levites, coming forth from other nations... They're priests of no gods. 
But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests which minister unto the lawns are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon their business. So the priests of other lands are not Levites or the sons of Aaron and are false priests of uh, false gods which are not accepted by God. Yep. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Sure. Okay, well, why don't you read Ezra chapter 2, verses 61 and 62, Don? No worries. And of the children of the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Koz, the children of Basilei, which took a wife of the daughters of Basilei, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they, as polluted, put from the priesthood. Gee, that was a tongue twister, Don. <laughs> <laughs> Good grief. I think we needed Alexander Scooby there. Yeah. But as you can see there, Don, in order to be a priest of God, one must prove that the genealogy traces back to Aaron, the brother of Moses. And this is in verse 62. These sought their register to be registered as priests among those that were reckoned by genealogy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they weren't found. Like they couldn't find them and say, yep, you're, you know, you're in the line of Aaron. So they were polluted and they were put out from the priesthood, okay? Yep. So basically... Priests before the Old Testament, okay? And in the New Testament, as a matter of fact, every saved person is a priest, and Jesus Christ is our high priest. But why don't we take a look and see what God has given us in the New Testament? Because the priesthood was for the Old Testament. You had to be a son of Aaron. You had to be a Levite. And you had to prove your genealogy to Aaron. Mm -hmm. Well, let's have a look and see what God's given us now in the New Testament. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, had God given us priests, he would have said so there, wouldn't he? Exactly, for sure. It doesn't right. mention priests. Doesn't mention in that priests. list. Uh, it pretty much covers everything: prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Uh, if, like you said, if he was going to put priests, that's where he'd put it. That's right. But he does. He doesn't, and he didn't. Okay, let's have a look. Why don't you read out First Timothy and Philippians on and see what else, what other offices of these men God has given us? Okay, First Timothy one eleven. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So God has given preachers, but not for Christians, Don. A preacher is to preach to the unsaved. So when someone preaches to the unsaved, he's not a pastor, he's not a teacher, he's a preacher. Mm -hmm. All right? Sure. Philippians 1.1 1, 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Well, there you go. There's two officers in the church, a bishop and a deacon. Mm -hmm. And the bishop basically is, is the pastor, and the deacons are those members of the church which are just below him, you know. The senior they, members. The senior members, exactly. They have some sort of authority. Uh, when I think of the... The last Pentecostal church I went to, we actually voted in the deacons. It's like it was like a ballot that you yeah. you would serve for a few years, and every year you you're up for election. Yeah, I suppose that's okay. I don't think they'll have I have a problem with that. No, I don't have a problem with it either. I have a problem with the Pentecostal church, but <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I'm talking about the way they sure you know they delegated the offices, but uh yeah what. One question, George. Mm -hmm. in, in the Catholic Church, the priests, they don't marry. Mm -hmm. But in the Orthodox Church, is it the same? No, it's not the same. Uh, this is one of the differences that they split over. Oh, okay. In the are, you Catholic Church, that, are you going to mention that later? Uh, no, I'll mention it now. Okay. Well, 
the the Catholics believe that their first pope, Peter, which was never in Rome, as they assume, uh, Peter never went to Rome, Paul did, but nevertheless, they believe that Peter wasn't married. But it's quite clear in the scriptures that Peter's mother-in-law is spoken about. Now, that means that Peter was married, but they don't accept that. Whereas the Orthodox see that and say, yeah, he was married, therefore we can marry. So that that's basically it. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, the the Catholics, where they got wrong about Peter being single, the Orthodox got right. But that doesn't mean because they got one thing right that everything else is right. Everything else is wrong. No, no. Yeah, but they are allowed to marry. And so they have children and have families, like yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. that's very, yeah, like I said, that's good because it's crazy how the Catholic priests yeah. are celibate yeah. and look and look at the problems they had. With, exactly. Uh, you know, pedophilia and homosexuality and stuff. It's. Uh. Yeah, okay. Sorry, go on, George. No, that's fine, Don. Uh, I, I don't mind sign tracking. It's uh, it's good fun. We get to bag people and we'll learn a few other things along the way. Well, actually, now that you mention, I remember when I was a Catholic, I was in the Catholic Church. I, I thank God now that I actually didn't do what I had. A, you know, we had a strong desire to be one of the auto boys. You know, when we used to go to Mass, you'd see these little boys collect the wine and the, ring the bell and... Mm-hmm. I really desire to do that. It's just like, oh, I'd love to do that. Thank goodness. Uh, I don't know. Well, I think my mother did ask the priest at one stage that if my boys could do it, but it just didn't happen. But thank goodness for that, because uh, who knows? What could have yeah. happened? Yeah, you're not wrong, Don. Uh, yeah. Praise God you won't. Yeah. Because, like I said, I was young. I was probably five or six, so who knows? I wouldn't have understood what was happening. Yeah, that's true. And the guy was a priest and, you know, look, you need to do this. God wants you to do this. And you think, oh, okay. Ah. He's, he's the priest who, you know, got to do what he says. Yeah. Sure. And that's probably what a lot of people, you know, what a lot of young boys believe. And it's, it's very sad. But anyway. Well, Don, look, another term that the Orthodox priests are referred to, as well as the Catholic priests, is the term father. Okay? Yep. Now, I'm going to read something in Matthew 23, verses 1 through to 9. How about I read the first four verses and you can read from verse 5. Now, what people need to understand here is that Jesus Christ is talking about the Pharisees and the scribes, which were the priests and the religious leaders of the time. Okay? Mm-hmm. All right, then, Matthew 23, verses 1 to 9. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Have you noticed on what the Jews call their religious leaders? Rabbi. Yep. And what do the Catholics and Orthodox call their priests? Father. Well, the, the Pope's called the Holy Father. I know, and Jesus Christ referred to God the Father once as the Holy Father before they took him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm. And yet they called this wicked man Holy Father. The Holy Father. Well, he's God on earth. Wouldn't like to be in his skin when he faces God. God on earth wearing uh, the the garb they wear. When you see those hats and things and robes, it's like... 
like especially at Christmas when they're walking down the you know, St. Peter's is it St. Peter's Cathedral there? Yeah. The, the stuff they're wearing, they just look. I don't know. It looks like some sort of Ku Klux Klan meeting or something. I know. <laughs> the high hats and I don't know. I don't get it. Yeah. It's weird. No, it's it's just ridiculous. Anyway. I'll just tell you a little story, Don, one of my experiences from many years ago. It was probably about 30 years ago when I first started to get involved in the Pentecostal movement. I told my dad, and he wasn't very happy. He was a very proud Greek Orthodox man. He hated priests, never went to church. Why did he hate the priests? Well, there were a few incidents that happened when I was a lot younger. He actually, one of the priests came around to our house when we were just kids and this priest was known to be a bit of a sleaze bag. He came around to ask my mum if she could get involved in some church function. I can't remember what it was about. But anyway, when my dad got home from work, because my mum was home by herself, all her boys were at school, my dad was at work, she was home by herself. And my mum told my dad, my dad his blood started to boil, hit the roof. He, he drove over to the church, grabbed the priest by the scruff of the neck and threatened to beat the living daylights out of him. And your dad said, was one big dude, man. Uh, he, was, he was a tough guy. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, he, he said to him he had no business coming to our house when he wasn't home, when my mum was home alone. And he had every right to do so. But anyway, that particular priest was my Greek school teacher. He hated my guts because of that, and I used to cop it quite a bit from him. But anyway, it was funny. <laughs> Just another side story. Once before class, me and one of my mates put a bucket of gravel on top of the toilet door so whoever opened it, it would just fall on them. Beautiful. Guess who it, guess who it fell on? <laughs> he came in the class and he had little bits of gravel in his big thick beard. Anyway, I copped it for that. I told my dad and my dad said, well, my dad just laughed and, you know, he goes, oh, well, you shouldn't have done that. I said, yeah, but you wanted to bash him. He goes, yeah, well, you shouldn't have done that to the priest. But anyway. When I first got involved in the Pentecostal movement, my dad wasn't too happy. And he said to me, look, why don't you go and speak to a Greek priest? This was some um, professor of priests. He quite knowledgeable. And I went there with my younger brother. Anyway, we walked in. I wasn't trying to be smart or anything. Walked in. It was a Saturday afternoon. And the priest was there with uh, another guy. They were discussing something. He said, can I help you? I said, yeah, look, I just want to ask you a few questions. I've got some questions from the Bible. He said, yes, my son, sit down. So we sat down there in the church pew sort of thing. We sat down, me, my brother, the priest, and this other guy. And the first question I asked him was this passage you just read out in Matthew. I said, you're titled Father. I said, but we're not supposed to call you Father. And he goes, what do you call your Father. I said, yeah, but I said, clearly it's not talking about my physical father. It's talking about religious people. And he didn't answer my question. He just said, what else do you want to know? I said, this scripture here that talks about the scribes that would like to walk around in long robes. I said, you wear long robes and you're called father. <laughs> and there's two things there immediately that don't sit well with me. He said, this discussion is over. He grabbed me by my arm, the other guy grabbed my brother, and they marched us out of the church, basically threw us out while he was chanting something. I can't remember. He said, don't ever set foot here again. Now, Don, if this was truly a man of God and he believed that what he was doing was right, shouldn't he have sat me down and said, okay, George, this is the reason we do it. Show me some scriptures to prove me wrong. But he didn't. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And this was like, from what everyone told me, the professor of priests back then, like he knew everything. And he couldn't answer me those two simple questions. Well, what was wrong with your questions? There was nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. I was being inquisitive. And your father had organised this? Pretty much. You know, so yeah. he would have said to the priest, look, please talk to my son because I'm yeah. worried about him. He's getting involved in a different type of religion. I don't know what it's about. Can you please talk to him? He just basically kicked you out because instead of saying, well, these are the reasons, let's sit down, I'll try and explain it to you. 
He just says, no, out. Exactly. Mm. That's right. Now, these scriptures, Don, that, we, that we've just read out, are clearly talking about religious leaders because Jesus says the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So that's who he's talking about. So he's saying, don't call these priests, religious leaders, whatever you want to call them, rabbi or father. And so far, the Jews call their religious leaders or priests, whatever, rabbi, and the Orthodox and Catholics call them father. All right? Now, didn't Jesus say, honour thy mother and father? Yes. All right? So why would Jesus say to me, honour your father, all right, but don't call him father? That doesn't make sense. No. And in Colossians 3.21, Paul writes, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Was Paul being disobedient? No. Nope. No, he wasn't. So clearly, the scriptures are referring to religious leaders who like to be called father. Well, the context of those scriptures that you read, it's clear, like you say, it's talking about religious leaders. That's right. It's not talking about your biological mother or father. You have to see the context of what he's talking about. That's right. And in this particular case, he's definitely talking about religious leaders because you know, what are rabbis? They're religious leaders. That's right. And, and, and father. I mean, he covered both of them. <laughs> yeah. So. So, so far, what we've seen is these people blatantly disregard Scripture. So obviously we're starting to see a pattern here that Scripture is not important to them. Would I be fair in saying that? Sure. Well, there's two simple ones that they completely ignore. The priest that you went to see didn't even want to answer it. Well, what's he going to say? Exactly. He didn't want to answer it because he couldn't answer it. Yeah, exactly. He, all he could do was throw you out. What's he going to say? The, the Bible's wrong? You can't say that. That's right. Well, let's have a look at another scripture, Don, here in Luke 20, 46. Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets, and the high seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at feasts. Now, I'm pretty sure this goes the same for Catholics. I haven't had much experience with Catholic priests, to be honest. But the Greek priests that I've seen, whether they be at weddings, at funerals, at so-called christenings, which is a load of absolute rubbish, Whenever you see them there, they're all always arrogant. They put their hand out for people to kiss. If they put their hand out, it's not to shake their hand. They want you to kiss their hand. And wherever they go, people suck up to them and they're at the best tables and they get fed first. And it's just amazing. I remember a funeral that I went to earlier this year. After the funeral, you know how people gather at a hall and they have some nibblies afterwards, you know, some finger food and that. But they were waiting for the, the, the priest to come out and bless the food. It was a long day. They'd been at the, the funeral service to the church, the drive back to the hall. The food was all out there set up. The priest was back there probably before anyone. And he was out the back chatting to someone and he knew that everyone was waiting for him to bless the food. I wasn't. I was ready to go and eat, but I thought, just for politeness sake, I'd keep my mouth shut. And they were waiting for him, and he knew, and he was just out the back room, and he was picking. He had a few nibblies out the back there while he was chatting with someone. It took him about 45 minutes on. The food had gone cold and soggy, and then he came out. People were starving. People, you could hear them whinging, you know, oh, where's the priest? When are you going to bless the food? What's happening? We're hungry with this, with that. He just didn't care, Don. It's their arrogance, you know what I mean? Yep. And they just make me sick. Well, you're saying you didn't. It's, it's the same with the uh, Catholic priests. I don't know about, I can't remember them putting their hand out for people to kiss. I do think actually when you get confirmed, you do kiss the bishop's ring. I was very young at the time. But, uh, but they love... Exactly what this scripture says. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces. They love to have the best seats. And same with the weddings. Like if the Catholic priest came to the wedding festival, he would have the best seat in the house. Yeah. 
it's, it's all, it was always the way. Another word that these priests like to be called on, and I'm sure it's the same in the Catholic religion, is reverend. They're even called reverend father. Yes. Why don't you read Psalm 111, verse 9? He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. Now, that's obviously talking about the Lord. Yeah. So what's his name, Don? Holy and reverent. Is his name? Is his name. <laughs> so these priests, right, which are not legitimate priests, who like to be called father, which Jesus said, call no man father, speaking of religious people, call no man father, and reverend is God's name, they are priests which like to be called reverend father. So basically, these men have basically no credibility for what they claim to be. What was, are, what was the priest's job in the Old Testament? And what were they to do? The priest's job was basically to um, serve God, to minister to God, and to be basically a middleman between men and God, so that, for example, men would bring sacrifices for the priests to sacrifice to cover their sins for for the following year. Mm -hmm. All right, and the priests would offer up sacrifices to God, and they had certain things that they had to do in the synagogues, and and that was their function. So he was a mediator in a sense, pretty much. And in the New Testament. It says there's only one mediator. That's right, the man Christ Jesus. In the New Testament church, there is no need for a priest. No, not at all. But somehow these guys are still around thinking that they they are the mediators between man and God. Mm -hmm. And they're still doing religious rituals and... Yep. I mean, they do... Obviously, they're not doing burning sacrifices or anything. Well, they're burning incense... They, but they're doing some sort of religious ritual. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. And there's no burning of incense done by any New Testament Christian. And were no, the masses, the didn't. well, you guys didn't call them masses, or do well, they, they call, call them masses? A, they call it a liturgy. It, which is similar. Was it in the current language, or did, like Catholicism, I think it was only in the 50 years ago, that was all done in Latin before... Up until 50 years ago, everything was done in Latin. Most people didn't even know what, what was being said. Yeah, put it this way. We, we used to go as kids. I haven't been... I've had to go to a few funerals out of respect for a family or something, but I didn't particularly want to be there. But you never understand what they're saying. A lot of it's in archaic Greek. So basically it's... You just go there and look, keep looking at your watch, hoping it'll finish soon. <laughs> yeah. You know? But anyway. How long did a service go for in the Greek Orthodox Church? Oh, too long, Don. It could go, it could go for two hours. Really? Oh, I could go for two hours. Well, well, at least the good thing about a Catholic service was only about 40, 50 minutes. Yeah. You know, it was pretty... It still took forever, though. But... Uh, Compared to a Pentecostal church, <laughs> it's two or three hours. It's oh, a nightmare. How long did they go for? Oh, forever and ever. Ugh. And the preacher just wouldn't shut up sometimes. They just kept going. And, it's, it's, and then they had to have the altar call and the music and some more songs. It's crazy. On you know, a Sunday night, you had to go to work the next day, and you're there still it's like 10 o'clock at night, and it's still going. Yeah. Drive you crazy. Right. So oh, really, crazy. I, so if you go to a, an Orthodox church, What's it called? A liturgy. Yeah. That's what you call it when you go to a church service? Well, I only know it because I checked it out. But um, It'll yeah, go for that, two hours. Yeah, it could go for two hours. But I remember when, when we were young, we never used to go the full two hours. We'd go the last half hour because my dad couldn't stand them, and, but he felt that he had to go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And as, as long as he made an appearance, it's like, it's like the Easter which, again, is not a Christian festival. But nevertheless, uh, people would start going from 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening. It wouldn't finish till midnight where everyone lit the candles. And we used to leave home at 11.30. The church was like a 10-minute drive. 
And by the time we got there, got parking, we were there 10, 15 minutes and it was over. One thing about my dad, thank God he hated the, the whole system. It was weird. He could see the hypocrisy. He could see the, the priests, how money hungry they were. And uh, they weren't, he knew they weren't men of God, but he felt like the religion is right, not the people in it. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Well, that's and, fair uh, enough. Yeah. That's fair enough not to blame the religion because of men, because we're the same, George. We never lost faith in God yeah. just because of, you know, like even in the Baptist church. I mean, that was a final yeah. straw for us. It was like, that's it. it yeah. inde an independent, fundamental Baptist King James only church, and they're a bunch of hypocrites. And yeah. you could turn around and say, ah, oh, this whole God thing is just nonsense. But well, we, we never thought that. We said, no, just because men stuff things up doesn't mean God doesn't exist. Yeah. So in a sense, even though he was wrong, at least yeah. he didn't give up his faith, faith because yeah. of corrupt priests. That's it's right. It's not a terrible thing. Well, no, it's not a terrible thing, but... Um, it's a good character, still, is what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, and common yeah. sense. A lot, a lot of people would give up their faith because of men's failings, which sure. what's that got to do with God? That's right. But anyway, Don, why don't we have a look at our next subject, infant baptism. Now, this doctrine is not found anywhere in Scripture. This practice is something that the church fathers gave the okay to many, many years ago. The Orthodox believe that the new birth, in other words, a person is born again, uh, takes place at baptism. They also believe that the baby receives the Holy Spirit and is sealed by the Holy Spirit at baptism. Now, what happens at this event? And Catholics have got them, Orthodox have got them. I know a lot of other so-called Christian religions have got them. Is what's called a godfather or godmother. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what this god again? This word is not a scriptural word. It's a man-made word. What a godfather or godmother is? They're basically like a sponsor, which makes a profession of belief or accepting Christ or believing in Christ on behalf of the baby, okay? Now, I'm sure the Catholics do that. I know the Orthodox do that. So basically, when this baptism takes place, the baby has no knowledge of it, do they? Of course They're not. Just babies. They don't know what's going on. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen one baby that doesn't scream and shriek and kick and shout and scratch. <laughs> well, what's going on? Yeah, I haven't seen one kid that sits there placidly with a smile on their face thinking this is nice. But anyway, so basically this is not the will of the baby. It's the will of the parents of the baby, true? Yep. And the family. You know, oh, you've got to baptise a kid. Yep, got to baptise it. Kid's got no say in it. Let's not let him grow up and decide what he wants to be. We're going to do this. We're going to make him a Christian. All right? So... Why don't you read John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, Don? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Wow. Look at verse 13, Don. They were born not of blood, right? So basically that means that if you're born into a, a saved family, it doesn't mean you're automatically saved. You have to get saved at some stage, true? Mm-hmm. All right. Nor of the will of the flesh. Did your flesh want to do right by God? <laughs> I know mine didn't. All right. But my inner man wanted to get saved. True? Sure. So your flesh resists God, doesn't it? Yes. It All wars right. against the spirit and wars against God. That's it. Look at that third one, nor of the will of man. Well, that cuts out Godfather and Godmother and sponsors and parents, doesn't it? Yep. But of God. Mm. Right? So basically, when they say, oh, we're doing it on the baby's behalf, just that one scripture. Well, in so, verse 12, it also says, even to them that believe on his name. And how does a yeah. baby believe on God? That's right, it can't. I mean, doesn't know anything yet. That's right. Do you remember anything 
of when you were a baby? I don't remember anything before four or five years old. Then, yeah, I mean, I remember probably bits and pieces. Maybe yeah. when maybe when I was two, maybe three or four years old. I suppose there's little bits and pieces I think I can remember, but not when I was a baby. Yeah, I don't remember ever. I, I don't remember my parents changing my nappies or anything like that. It's just something that's just not. You know, it's not in my memory. That's right. So basically, Don, baptism is a work. It's not a. It's not a faith. It's a work. Now, how do they baptize in the Orthodox? All right, they dunk the baby three times, completely immerse it in water. Uh-huh. So it's I know not, the, it's not baby the sprinkles. No, the Catholics I know they sprinkle. So is they, that one of the reasons they left? Or was that another reason? That's that's one of the reasons. Yeah. Uh-huh. So they completely dunk them, but they dunk them three times: once in the name of the Father, once in the name of the Son, once in the name of the Holy Spirit. Right, completely underwater. Completely underwater. Well, at least they got that part right. Well, they got that part right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but again, it's, you know, like you said, uh, how can a baby believe on his name? And can't. it's not, it can't. And it's not of the will of man. So that rules out infant baptism already. But let's look at a few other things. Baptism is a work. It's not a step of faith. It's an actual work that we do. It's not something, you know, you have to believe in your heart and this and that. It's simply an, an outward work. Yep. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? They believe that babies are saved by being dunked, and that's a work, and it's not by works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Paul says a very interesting thing here. Paul, the greatest Christian, wrote most of the New Testament. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, Don, if baptism gives the new birth and seals one with the Holy Spirit, wouldn't you say that was a pretty stupid thing that Paul said? Yeah. Yeah, sure. You know, for Christ sent me not to baptize. I mean, that's a whole idea that Jesus Christ came, he died for our sins. Now, if baptism saves, if infant baptism saves, well then, that would be the dumbest thing Paul ever said. Sure. I mean, even as a born-again Christian, it's, it's an ordinance from God. It's got nothing to do with our salvation. Nothing at all. If you get saved and somehow you don't get baptised before you die, you're still saved. That's right. It's just something God does like us to do as a saved believer. But if somehow you missed it or forgot, it's no big deal. Well, it's something God wants us to do, but like you said, it doesn't save us. But what happens also at baptism, Don, at the infant baptism at the same time, is holy chrismation. Now, the baptism, the Orthodox believe, is being born again. And holy chrismation, which happens at the same time, is when the baby, after being baptised, then receives the Holy Spirit and is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Yep. Why don't you read Ephesians 1.13? In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when does a person get sealed with the Holy Spirit? After that ye believed. Uh, Can a baby believe? Nope. (laughs) No, a baby can't believe. No, it's impossible. Imagine the Greek Orthodox religion was a tree. I think we've basically taken to it with a really sharp axe and that tree's about to fall. (laughs) Yeah, yeah uh, it's, it's just all these traditions. So it's like it's very similar to, so far, it's very similar to Catholicism. Yeah, they're very similar, Don. Yeah. Only small differences. Yeah. It's a, when Catholics, they, they sprinkle, they don't they don't immerse in baptism, but they still baptise babies for the same reasons. It's, it's to cleanse away sin and 
they have godparents. And I think actually the Catholic godparents are also, it's a vow that if, for example, my parents, something happened to my parents, they had a car accident and they died, well, then they become my parents, my godparents. Fair enough. Yeah, so they, like, they give a vow that if anything happens to my parents, well, then they adopt me and they raise me. Um, yeah. Whether that will happen or not, I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've never heard of anyone doing that, but yeah. I suppose it never happened in my circles. I just no one I know actually probably died where the children had to go be adopted by the godparents. But maybe yeah. it happens. Maybe they do do it. I don't know. Yeah. But that's that is another reason. So when someone yeah. asks you, can you be a godfather or godmother? It's a it's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big responsibility. Yeah, it sure is. Well, Definitely is. Yes. I'm just going to show another scripture here, Acts 10, verse 47. Now remember that they believe that the baby's baptized, he's born again. In other words, he gets saved. Then he receives the Holy Spirit and is sealed by it. Acts 10, 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So Paul's saying, these people have received the Holy Ghost, so they're saved. So he's saying, well, can anyone refuse water? They should be baptized. They've already received the Holy Spirit. Mm. So it's the other way around to what the Orthodox believe. You know, did, did God change his method of operation and forget to tell us? Mm, it's true. Actually, we, when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit, and then... Yeah, and get, then you're baptized. Then we, like you know, said, as an ordinance, we obey God and get baptized. That's right. We're here, they're baptizing you first, and then you receive the Holy Spirit. That's right. So we receive the Holy Spirit after we believe. That's God's way, the Bible way, not as an unknowing baby at baptism. After a work. That's right, after a work. And we're not saved by works. We receive the Holy Spirit when we saved by faith, not by That's works. Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, Don, everything so far... Is completely opposite to Scripture. How can these people call themselves Christians? Well, well, probably people are sick of us saying it, but every time we discuss topics, it's usually the polar opposite. Exactly. <laughs> I remember when we did the slaying of the Spirit last week, it's always the polar opposite. It's the opposite, isn't it? Because if you know, it makes sense in a sense, if, you, if you're going to... Uh, disobey the word of God and not follow the word of God, well then whatever you do will be the opposite to the word of God. Yeah. So if God says do it this way and man decides to do it their way, well it'll be the opposite. Yeah. It will never be just a little bit off. It's just amazing how it's always the opposite. So it's amazing how people can't see that. Like when you read the Bible and then you see what they do, it's so clear and obvious that this is not even close, but yet... They accept it. That's right. You know why they accept it? The one thing all religions have in common, all these false religions, is their terminology. They all use the word God. They all hold the Bible in their hand, right? Uh, whether it's the King James or a modern version, which is a false false Bible, nevertheless, the people think it's, it's the word of God. They all use the word God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, God bless you, do the right thing, love thine enemy, all that sort of thing. So the people figure, well, everything else they must be doing is right too. Little did they know that everything else, like you said, is the opposite, the complete opposite. And they figure, well, if this man's using words like God and Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, they, they must know what they're talking about, so that, that's good enough for us. So, Don, if we're not saved by baptism, what are we saved by, right? Let's have a look at a few scriptures. Romans 1, 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So anyone that's listened to our podcast on salvation knows that the gospel of Christ is the power of God and salvation, and we need God's righteousness, and that's where it's found in the gospel. It's not in baptism. Baptism doesn't save anyone, Don. 
if you got John the Baptist and took him down to the River Jordan where Jesus Christ was baptised and got him to, to baptise you a million times, you'd still go to hell. Yep. Because it doesn't save anyone today. It's as simple as that. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So basically Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, is about to declare the gospel to them, and he's telling them, by which also ye are saved. So we can see in Romans, it's a power of God unto salvation, that's where God's righteousness is found. And Paul tells the Corinthians the gospel is what saved them. Now, if baptism had anything to do with our salvation, Don, wouldn't you think it would be written there? Sure. And it's not, is it? No. No. It's always faith and believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, That's where the salvation is. That's right. Baptism as we'll see probably later, is just an ordinance. That's right. It's just a commandment that God wants us to do. That's it. But it's, I said, if if you're saved and somehow you don't get baptised, just say you get saved today and tomorrow you get hit by a truck and yeah. you don't get baptised, well, you, you, you're going to heaven. It's fine. You're the going thief, to heaven. The thief on the Full cross stop. wasn't baptised. That's right. He, he went, Jesus says, tonight you'll be with paradise with me. Yeah. What a thing to hear. Did he say, <laughs> oh, hang on. Someone quickly splash some water all over him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is, is someone want to be my godfather? <laughs> no. He just said, yep, Lord, remember me. Yep, you're saved. You're done. Well, Don, why don't you read the next lot there? Romans, it's a long one. Romans 10, 9 to 17. Sure. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, Don, how does a baby believe and confess the Lord? Well, they can't. They can't. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. I don't see a baby screaming and crying, confessing the Lord Jesus. All right? A baby can't believe in his heart that God hath raised him from the dead. All right? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? Can a baby call upon the name well, of the Lord? Wouldn't the argument be that because a baby can't confess the Lord Jesus and hasn't got knowledge of God, that therefore something has to be done for them because they're born in this original sin, and therefore if they die, they will go to hell? Isn't that the whole argument that that's why you need a Godfather to to do it for the baby, to act as, as the mediator for the baby. Well, that's that's exactly what they believed on. But again, John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, nor of the will of man. It's not man's will. So if a baby dies, I mean, they haven't been saved. No. So what happens? Well, they go to heaven. Why? There's no knowledge of sin. Yep. Because uh, God doesn't impute sin where there is no knowledge. So it's like someone who's mentally retarded on. We've seen them. It's it's very sad to see people like that who just, they're just that mentally retarded 
they they don't know good from bad. God will not impute sin to that person when there is no knowledge of sin. Sure. Well, they don't understand the Lord. They don't understand anything. They can't. They don't understand. Anything. They can't be accountable for something they don't know anything about. That's right. And I mean, can you? They're not accountable because they haven't sinned. That's right. I mean, can you imagine a mum, you know, with her going in the shopping trolley in the supermarket and they sit the babies there on the trolley, right? And the mother turns around for a minute. This little kid reaches out and grabs a chocolate bar. Mmm, sees a chocolate bar, yummy. Reaches out and grabs it and shoves it in his pocket, right? I'll save it for later, right? Technically, he's stolen that, hasn't he? Yep. Does he know it? Nope. What kind of God will say, ah, you've stolen that, that's it, you're going to hell? Mm. But that, that's what the Orthodox believe. They, they believe that God, they must have a very low standard of God because if they believe that God would send an innocent baby into hell, that's not the God that we believe in. So when does a child have knowledge of sin? I don't know, Don. I don't know. I mean, there must be, be a point in time where a child is held accountable. Yeah, but I so I guess that's up to God. When God knows a child's heart, when they've sinned against God and they know it, maybe they're accountable from then. Well, I think I think there there is a way in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. If you look in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. Adam and Eve, when God created them, they were naked. Yeah. And they didn't feel naked and they weren't ashamed. They weren't ashamed, yeah. But once they sinned, they says that they knew they were naked. And they were ashamed. And they were ashamed and they put fig leaves. Is that right? They, they covered themselves. Yeah, that's right. And that's what when God said to them, why are you hiding from me and so on. So yeah. I think it's, it's my opinion, but it is based on scripture, that when a child, at one eventually they... Like when a baby is young and naked, they look innocent. Yeah. You know, like you'll see baby photos that they're naked. And, you know, people have always got photos of their babies in the bathtub and so on. And yeah. it is, it's innocent. Yeah. But there'll come a point in time when that child, say it's a girl, a daughter, they will be ashamed in front of their father. Yeah. They will start to realize they're naked. That's when they've crossed over. So it could, could, be, be, right. could be at different ages. And the same for a boy. At, one, at some point in time, the child will not want to be want their parents to see them naked. Then they've, I think, that's when they've crossed over, and now they need to be born again. Yeah, that's a very good point, Don. Very good point. For what saith the scripture? For what saith the scripture? So that's just a, a, an observation that people sometimes think: when, well, when does a baby or when does a child yeah. have knowledge of sin? And if you have children, when your child you walk into their room and they get angry, like, oh, why didn't you knock? Because they, they were naked or whatever. Yeah. That's it. They've crossed over. Now they need yeah. salvation. They need, right. they need to be born again because they've got knowledge of their nakedness. And that's yeah. what happened with Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they had knowledge of their nakedness. So when a yeah. child sins and they have knowledge of their nakedness, that's it. Salvation is necessary. Before that, if they died, they're fine. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be at different ages for different children. So it can't yeah. be a specific time. It would probably be roughly within a certain amount of years, but uh, it definitely probably be different from, you know, different children. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. And, and again, Don, once that child does know, God's not going to allow it to die and send it to hell and go, ah, you know, you're going to hell. He's going to give it opportunities to get saved. Sure. God is not a respecter of people. That's right. It says then that therefore everyone will have the same chance. Yep. So anyway, basically the Orthodox believe that baptism washes away sins. Now in 1 Peter 3.21, it says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Now if you read up to there, you think, well, it does save us. But in brackets after that, it's got not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the erection of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't wash away our sins. It's just a good conscience towards God. So basically, once you get saved, God wants every Christian to do that. 
right? Yep. And we should do that. So it doesn't wash it away our sins. What it is, it's a figure or it's symbolic of the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Which God wants a believer to do for the answer of a good conscience towards God. Now, one of the main reasons the Greek Orthodox used to justify baptizing babies is that in the Old Testament, the Jews circumcised male uh -huh, babies. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, I can see where they're okay. going with this, yep. All right. Now, they used to circumcise the baby boy at eight days old to justify this heresy. Now, the problem here is, Don, if that's the case, why then do they baptize baby girls as well? Hmm. So they yeah. actually baptize at eight days old, is it, even in the... No, no. No, kids, kids can be baptised up to two years old. Right, okay. So yeah, it does, as long as they're a baby. Uh -huh. That's one of the reasons they used to justify infant baptism. Because the Jews did it to babies, so we need to baptise the babies. That's right. So they consider that as like a, some form of circumcision? I guess so. It's just like they relate, relate it to it. Yeah, relate it to circumcision. And if they do that, well, then they have no reason to baptise baby girls. <laughs> Yeah, sure. But they do. But they do. And also, Don, if baptism is needed for salvation, like you said earlier, how did the thief on the cross make it? Well, he must have got, what, did he get some sort of special dispensation for it? No. That's right. Exactly. It's not necessary for salvation. Yeah. But it's like we just read, it's just an ordinance from God. It's something he wants us to do. And That's when right. you're saved, there's so many things we can't do. <laughs> <laughs> Being That's baptized, right. it's pretty easy. Yeah. You just gotta... And what it is, yeah, go on. I'm just saying, all you got to do is get dunked. I like to obey the easy ones because they're easy. <laughs> That's right. Because <laughs> there's so many that I don't obey. Therefore, yeah. when I get these easy ones, I'll, I'll obey those ones pretty easily. I mean, come on, yeah, give me, dunk me. And if that's what God wants me to do, I'll do it. No big deal. That's right. What's the problem? That's right. And it's just a symbolic thing to basically identify because when you when you go under the water all right it's christ died he was buried so you're identifying with the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ you go under the water you come up again it's simply symbolic of christ's death and it's something god wants us to do it doesn't save anyone in the book of acts another reason that they use the Orthodox use to justify this. And I read this recently. Uh, a guy did a whole thesis on infant baptism. He didn't give one scripture. And this was a guy high up in the Orthodox Church. He didn't give one scripture at all, Don. He just gave opinions and philosophies. And part of the fact was he said, well, you know, the Jews circumcise their boys. So that's why we the baptized babies, again, which is nonsense. But another reason he said was, I don't know if you remember, but in the book of Acts, when Peter or someone went to baptize someone, the whole household was was baptized. Yep. Right? And they'll say, see, that means children were baptized too. Now, that's a huge assumption, Don. You know what I mean? Sure. Just because just there was a whole bap um, family baptized, says, and those that would believe were baptized. So it's quite clear in that household, only believers were baptized. Yep. Now, I'm sure that there was babies in the household. There's no way they would have baptized them. They're not believers. And these people were baptized after they got saved. Yep. So there's no scriptural evidence for anything that the Orthodox have done so far. So far, they're just being discredited more and more. So where are they getting all these traditions from? Is it just, is it from those epistles that you mentioned earlier, from those ch early church fathers, or is it just tradition? Like, where are they getting all this stuff from? It's, it's a bit of both, Don. And basically what you'll find with the Orthodox religion, both that and the Catholics, you'll find that what they believe in is a mixture of a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Judaism, 
and a lot of paganism. So it's just a mishmash of all of them. It's just a mishmash of all of them. They haven't got anything right. A couple of friends of mine who are saved, I believe they're saved. This is a story they told me many, many years ago. They went to visit a guy that they used to go to school with who had become a Greek Orthodox priest. And they were about the same age, they're probably around, today they're probably around 45 years old. And they were saved for a number of years and they were telling me the story, how they wanted to go and talk to this guy because they heard he became a Greek Orthodox priest. Anyway, they found him, they went for a coffee, they sat down, they showed him all the appropriate scriptures and that. This guy could see, they said to him, can you see that what the Orthodox religion believes from what we've shown you? is against scripture and he didn't want to say it but ultimately they pinned him down and he said basically we put the traditions of our church fathers and their writings above the authority of scripture now i was an add-on and i have no reason to doubt what my friend said but this is what they said well from what we've read so far from what we've seen they it's believable they do <laughs> Yeah. I mean, because all the stuff they're doing yeah. uh, is not scriptural. So where are they getting this stuff from? That's right. Not from the Bible. They've got to be getting it from somewhere else. And the priest you went to see to ask him about what the scriptures say, he kicked you out. Yeah, kicked me out. Get out of here. I'm not, yeah. I'm not even going to answer this. So, so far we've seen, Don, that priests, the Greek priests, whether they're Greek or Catholic, one and the same thing, they're not legitimate priests. They call themselves words which Jesus Christ said, do not call yourselves. Infant baptism is an absolute joke. It's not found anywhere in Scripture. The reasons they do it are all wrong. And they can't justify anything that they, that they do. So, so far, the Orthodox religion is not looking too well, is it? No. Not at all. Well, it does look very similar to Catholicism so far. There's the only difference I've seen is well, the priest actually can get married, and secondly, yep. they immerse the babies when they baptize them rather than sprinkle water on their That's head. Right. But otherwise, That's everything right. else is pretty much the same. Yep. They walk around in log robes. They call themselves like, Father. Yeah, Reverend Father to boot. Yep. They also call, the, the, they have a leader just like the Catholics have a leader. He's the ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew the First. And he's stationed in Constantinople, and where uh, he doesn't have the how the Pope is out there and so popular, he's not like that. Yeah, I've never heard of it. No, I'd never heard of him until so hang I on, what you're study on it. What you're saying is there's like the Pope is the he's the ultimate leader of the Catholic Church. Yes. Like there's Catholics in every country in the world, mm -hmm. and each country has cardinals and so on but then if, yeah. it'll always lead back to the head man the pope that's right so have the orthodox got a head man yes and that's what you're talking about yes so all the different orthodox religions of all the different countries mm -hmm. he's like the head man he's the head man so basically greece would have a head man russia would have a head man latvia and so on and so forth but this guy, since I think the early 90s, was made like the head of it. It's called the Eastern Orthodox Church because when the two split, obviously Rome was in the West and Constantinople was in the East. Mm -hmm. So the Orthodox Church is sometimes called Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox. He is basically the, the head honcho. Right. But he's not God on earth. No, they don't believe that. Right. And that's that's another one of the reasons that uh, I suspect they split because the Catholics do believe the Pope is God on earth. And what's his name? Bartholomew I. That's not his the name he was born with. He's actually a Greek fella. But just like when the Pope becomes a Pope, he takes on the name of one of their, I don't know, so-called saints, the Greek guy's taken on a name from someone else. And has he got, does he live in some sort of palace or something like the Vatican City or anything like that? I'm, I'm not sure, Don. I'm not sure, but uh, he's 
probably does live in some opulent surroundings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you said, they, they keep very quiet under, yeah. the, under the radar. I mean, I mean, everyone knows the Pope, but like I said, I've never heard about a head honcho of the Orthodox religion churches. I didn't even know if they had a, a head person in, the, in their country. Yeah. What's the head man called in the country? They're usually called patriarchs, Don. Patriarchs, okay. Yeah. Like a patriarch is like the father of an organisation. Like in Catholic, I think they're called cardinals. Yeah. I don't think they're called cardinals in the Greek. Right. Patriarch. I, yeah, I could be wrong, but nevertheless. Nice name, patriarch. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, it is. It's uh, it's very, very like I said, the similarities are definitely there. Yeah, and I'm sure there's probably a lot more. Yeah, but I mean, there are differences, but but doctrinally, I don't think there really is. No, not really. Mm. I mean, they're also into works. Well, that's what their salvation is all about, Don. Mm. It's uh, faith and works, and as you'll see towards the end of this podcast, uh, I'm going to give some quotes of these church fathers where it's clear what they believe in. Basically what the Orthodox believe is that salvation is a process and you're born again at birth, uh, sorry, you're born again at baptism, you receive the Holy Spirit at baptism, which is called the Holy Chrismation, and then throughout your life you've got to attend church partake of the sacraments, which include the Eucharist, which is that nonsense about um, eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ, confession to priests, which is non-scriptural, and that has pagan origins. Basically, there's, there's a few other things, but as long as you do all these things, You'll, you'll ultimately get to heaven. And even if you don't, when you're dead, the priest will pray for a fee, of course, uh, will pray you into heaven. So even after you die, yeah, the priest oh, yeah. the priest can do certain prayers for you to get out of... What well, do you get? Like in the Catholics believe in purgatory. Do Greeks also have a purgatory? No. The Orthodox, they don't? So where does the person go? Straight to hell or heaven? Hell. Hell. So if they're in hell, they can get prayed out of there. Yeah, if they're in hell, they can get prayed out, prayed out of there. And I've seen so many funerals where the priest says all these words and this and that. The poor grieving widow actually puts her hand in a wallet and takes out the sum of money, whether it's $20, $50, $100, and the priest puts his hand out and actually takes it because he's praying that person out of hell into heaven, making sure he's going to heaven. And you know what? That's exactly what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 23. Remember when he says they devour widows' houses mm-hmm. for, for a pretense? That's right, because they're getting these people at the most vulnerable time. That's right. They will pay anything. Yeah, exactly. Well, especially, imagine a grieving mother that lost a son. Yeah. They would sell their house, they would sell everything they own if they could pay the priest money if the priest said to them, yeah, look, if you give me a lot of money, I'll pray for your son every night. Yeah. And what mother wouldn't do that? Exactly. And they just take it. they got yeah. no conscience. None whatsoever, Don. That's None why whatsoever. when we were speaking about that Pastor Skiff also from the Baptist Church, same thing. Yeah. They've got no yeah. conscience. They take yeah. advantage of people. They don't care. They don't, like I said, I don't know how they sleep at night. Probably pretty comfortably in the, you know, Rich opulent in houses. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's very very sad. Yeah. Just a side note: uh, a common friend of ours, he used to give quite a lot of money to the Greek Orthodox Church to this one particular priest. He hit the roof when he found out that his uh, this particular priest bought his son a Porsche. <laughs> <sighs> You know, I mean, how blatantly obvious is that? That's just the, like you know a I mean? slap in the face to boot. It is. It is. And, and, and you know, I'm talking about he immediately stopped giving any, not even a cent. I preached a gospel to him recently and first time was about three years ago and it was very uncomfortable. But the second time it was for a good hour and he actually listened. 
whether it was just humouring me or not, I don't know. But anyway. So these the priests, they're actually all pretty wealthy. Ah, they're loaded, Don. They're absolutely loaded. So the, the I don't know if you know about the financial situation. I know that, like in the Catholic Church, that the money somehow does end up going to, you know, it goes up further up the ladder till it gets to the higher authorities. I don't know exactly how it works, but each parish will have, you know, the priest has to give the money, I think, to the bishops and the bishops give it to the cardinal. I think it goes all the way back to Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, so is is that what the Orthodox religions are called? Are they, do they call them parishes? What, or is there a different word for it? Uh, I'm not sure, Don. I've been out of that religion for so long. I'm not really sure, and the, to be honest with you. So do you know about the money? Like, does it stay with each church? Like, if the priest of a certain church of the local, of the suburb, say a Greek Orthodox church in one of the suburbs, yeah, he is he the owner of that church and he collects all the money, or how does it work? I I think so. They do help some poor people, but if you look at the if you look at the churches themselves on the inside, Don, they're adorned with gold. Everything's gold. There's just so much gold in the place. It's not funny. Really? Uh, I, I, I'm surprised that people don't break in and well, steal it. I was about to say, well, <laughs> really? Is it full of gold? Full of gold. I gold. thought it was just fake gold. No, it's full of gold. Gold everywhere. Hmm. Now, you know, that that's people buying and paying for certain things, thinking that that's going to get them into heaven, giving the priests money. These priests are pretty cashed up. And they get paid for... Weddings. Ah, oh, Don, they get paid a fortune. They get paid for baptisms. Yeah, everything. Do they have Do they have a christening and stuff like that as well? Yep. Like, well, like the christening. Holy, well, christening is the baptism, isn't it? Christening is the baptism. Now, yeah. what about, like in Catholicism, we have the Holy Communion. Do they have another step when the child gets older? Uh, no, there's. we don't have a confirmation like you guys do. But basically, we have to go and partake in the Eucharist. At a certain age or any age? Oh, any age, it doesn't matter. Okay. But but you have to do it and keep doing it, basically. So they get paid for the weddings, for the funerals, for baptisms. And if a person wants their loved one to be prayed for, someone that's died, they will yeah. go see the priest and also pay him and he'll take and that's say, right. no worries, I'll, I'll do a special prayer for this person. That's and right. they go yeah. out the back and have a glass of scotch. Yep, and <laughs> not only that, I've been to cemeteries, for example, not a funeral. If I've gone a long time ago, I don't go to a cemetery anymore. I believe it's a complete waste of time. But uh, when I used to go, you'd see a little old lady, a few uh, grave plots up, and there'd be a priest there chanting and singing and carrying on for about 10 minutes, and she'd be weeping over the, the death of her husband or her son or whatever, and should be grieving, and the priest would be there singing, you know, going through the motions for about 10, 15, 20 minutes, then putting his hand out and just leaving her alone. You know, it's just a job, simple as that. Mm. And it, it just it just made me so angry, Don, when I used to see that sort of thing. Yeah. It re really, really grieved me. Well, I said they get people at the most vulnerable time. Yeah. And if they actually do believe that the priest has some sort of power or some sort of connection to God. I mean, why wouldn't you do everything you can exactly. for him to you know, pray for your husband or your children or whatever? Yeah. I mean, because this is what they believe. That's right. And they're grieving and they're, they feel compelled and obliged to do whatever they can to help their loved ones get out of hell and go to heaven. Just a little story, Don, now that I remember, because I might forget later. My brother-in-law currently is in Greece. Now, when he was here in Australia, he's living in Greece now, he moved there. God knows why he went over to that God-forsaken country, but nevertheless, when he was here, I'd preached to him. And I thought at one stage I was getting through to him. And he was under conviction, I could see that. So I explained to him, I had a Greek Bible with me, showed him all the appropriate scriptures, and I said to him, can you see that what the Orthodox Church is doing is wrong? He said, 
he goes, look, from what you've shown me, he goes, yeah, he goes, they're opposite to the Bible. I said, well, what are you going to do? He goes, I'm going to go and talk to the local priest, All right? Anyway, I knew that local priest. And of all the priests that I've ever known, this particular guy was a very humble man, a very nice man, you know what I mean? He looked genuinely like a really nice fella. Well, they're the ones you got to be careful of. I know. <laughs> the ones that look nice, look out. Anyway, my brother-in-law went and spoke to this guy, and I said to him, show him this scripture, show him this scripture, show him this, this, and this, right? So he went there. I gave my brother-in-law so many scriptural reasons as to why the Orthodox Church was wrong. He went to this priest and he said to him, listen, father, whatever. He goes, my brother-in-law is uh, left the Orthodox Church and he's one of these born-again Christian guys and he showed me this, this, this and this. The priest didn't even bother looking at it. Do you know what he said? What did he say? He said, this guy, right, and this is a word used in Greek, which I won't use, but in English, he said, this guy is nothing but a masturbator. What a wanker. But in Greek. You can say that word. Yeah. <laughs> and you know the Greek word, right? No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. what, what is it? <laughs> Malaka. <laughs> right? That's what he called me. The Greek priest said, this guy is nothing but that. And that's it. Right? And they had a good laugh about it. And he came and he actually told me and, and laughed about it. I said, are you serious? He goes, yeah, that's what he said. I said, did he show you any scriptures to prove me wrong? He goes, no. I said, that's all he said, yeah. And he accepted that? And he accepted that. Well, like, what, what do you say, George? Like, exactly again, it's, say. it's look, when you look at all the different religions, uh, that's why these, you know, these independent fundamental Baptist churches, the pastor's almost a priest. Yeah. Pretty much what he says, that's it. Yeah. Well, what's the difference? Seriously, well, if people go back and listen to the Twilight Zone yeah. and, you know, you feel that you're a, a born-again church and that you don't follow priests anymore, well, you should look, take a second look at yourself. Yeah. Take a second look at your church. Just because a pastor says something doesn't, yeah. and it's not according to the Word of God doesn't mean it's true because they say anything and yeah. do anything and that's it. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. What's the difference? That's right. There's no difference. Somehow these church leaders, whether it's Orthodox, Catholic, Baptist, they're all the same. Yeah, that's right. Well, Don and I had a couple of guys which I got saved. They were a couple of brothers. And they used to come to my house many years ago. They used to come around 7 o'clock at night, would have dinner. We used to stay up to 4 or 5 in the morning, Don. And I had to work on those Saturday mornings. And I said to them, four or five, I go, fellas, I've got to get up in a couple of hours. But I loved it. I enjoyed it. And I taught them so much. And everything we've talked about on the podcast, I showed them. And they were so zealous, so keen, like full-on King James, like we are. And a pastor got a hold of them, and they became the opposite, Don. Oh, Pastor so and so said you don't have to quote scripture word for word. We don't want to be like robots and stuff like that. I told them straight, I said, These are doctrines of devils. Mm. I said, You guys have been deceived and I said, I don't want to know you. I tried to tell them a few times, tried to show them that what they believed was wrong and they didn't want to know it. And basically God says an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. After that I, I wipe my hands clean, wash my hands said, see you later, I want nothing to do with you. And I told him quite clearly. And that's because... And this was a King James only pastor. Because the pastor told him. pastor told him. And that's good enough. That's the final didn't authority. Give the, didn't give them one scripture to back up what he said. He said to them, you don't have to quote scripture. He actually said that when a pastor speaks, it's the same as scripture. Well... Now, men get things wrong, don't they? Sure. We men, we get things wrong at times. Does the Holy Spirit ever get things wrong? Never. The Word of God is never wrong. Man sometimes gets things wrong. He may interpret something the wrong way. Right? There are some scriptures which are vague and are hard to be interpreted. Right? And when you get to those, you may get something wrong. 
how can me getting something wrong be the same as Scripture? Anyway, crazy. Well, we read the Scriptures earlier about how these, whether they're a priest, whether they're a pastor, and what it says, and, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief yeah. seats in the synagogues. Yeah. Now, that's definitely true about the priests, whether it's Orthodox or Catholics, but, you know, when you think about it, the Pastors are the same. They love the uppermost rooms. If we go to a feast, they get in the front seats. Uh, they're yep. always the ones that have to be respected, and they love to be greeted. And uh, now, where do you draw the line? I mean, it's it's a tough one because you know you, he's your pastor. You need to, you need to respect him. He, he does have to be treated a little bit sure. differently, I suppose. Of course. But I think it's up to them to say, look, don't sit me at the front. I'm going to sit with the people. That's right. You know, like just like I think they're the ones that have to say it because do Jesus say if you want to be a leader you must be a servant? Well, they walk around like they're high and mighty. That's right. Mm. Instead of saying, look, I'm gonna just don't sit me at the front. I want to be sat at the back. Yep. Be humble. That's right. But they love it. Another thing, Don, which you mentioned, which reminded me about synagogues. From what I've seen from pictures and what I've read in the Bible of. Uh, synagogues, is, you know, God's temple in particular. You had the front part, right, where the congregation sat, true? Mm -hmm. Then you had the priest out the front, and behind him was the Holy of Holies, which only he could walk into, right? Isn't that how the Orthodox and Catholic churches are set up? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're synagogues. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, it's, it's, a, it's a mishmash, using your words, of Christianity, Judaism, and paganism. It's um, a mongrel religion. Exactly. I suppose it would be another way of putting it, just inbreeding of different types of religions, and they've somehow come up with this, you know, whether it's called Catholicism or Orthodox, but, but it is, it's a mess. Yeah. A bit of tradition, a bit of Christianity, a bit of, like you said, Judaism. I actually didn't think about that, but you're right. Then a bit of pagan religion, and you just don't know what you know whether it's Arthur or Martha. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, George, I think we're going to have to maybe call this one a night because we've got so much to cover. We've still got the, the big guns are coming out now, Don. Mary gonna, worship. Mary, you're going to talk about Mary next. Well, see, that's going to take forever and a day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So how about instead of making this podcast two and a half hours or two hours, let's make it a bit shorter. <laughs> yeah. It's still going to be long. It's probably going to be an hour and a half or so. Maybe we can do this in two parts. Yeah, definitely, Don. There's still, there's still a few subjects to cover. Look, Don, there's many, many things that the Orthodox and Catholic Church have in common and things that they do which are not scriptural, and we can't cover all those things. But we're just looking at the main ones. Yeah. You know what I mean? If someone can't see that these churches have nothing to do with Jesus Christ and Christianity and the Word of God from these main themes that we're covering, well, they're lost. They're, they're not going to see it. They're just proud and not willing to see the truth. Well, I mean, exactly what you said. If they can't see the the major problems, how, well, yeah. how are they going to see the minor ones? That's right. So if we're going to, you know, let's we'll just cover the major yeah. uh, heresies, yeah. uh, the major contradictions to the Bible, and you know, we're not going to worry about all the little minor ones because I say if you can't see the major ones, yeah, what's the point of trying to cover the minor ones? That's right. Because, as you said, there's heaps, I mean, pretty much everything they do is not in the Bible. That's right. Because if, if their major ones are not in the Bible, obviously the minor ones are going to be, uh, it's going to follow yeah. the origin of the major ones. As a Catholic, I can't think of anything they did that was correct, except that they believe in the Trinity. Yeah. That's about it. That's right. I can't think of anything else. That's right. Nothing else they do is from the Bible. No, it's not. Well, it's... But because they hold that book up, kiss it, people think, well, they're holding the Bible up. <laughs> they must know what they're talking about. Yep. All right, so how about we call this one a night, do part two next week? No worries. And so I can, I can actually hear the music, and yeah. that means it's telling us <laughs> that uh -huh. shut up, you blokes. 
you've enough. Said, yeah, you've said enough. You've bagged enough people. And uh, as usual, we always <laughs> we always got to have a dig to the King James only fundamental Baptist churches, don't we? Oh, of course. They, they that they goes go. without saying. Just to let you guys know, you King James occasionally independent fundamental Baptist churches, you're gonna get it all the time because you guys are the worst. Oh, yeah. I think you're worse than Catholics. I think you're worse yeah. than the uh, Orthodox because the stuff you guys say, shocking. So, no free ride for you guys. You're always going to cop. All right. All right, John. Well, we'll talk again next week. Have a good uh, weekend. You too. Say hi to the missus. No worries. You too. And uh, we'll catch up soon. Okay. See you later. Bye. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen.